found out there's no introductions, we'll, we'll just get started. I'm Charles Kaminsky. Uh, I work for HPCC Systems. I'm a senior architect there. And uh, this is Bill Fox. Bill Fox, I'm the senior director of healthcare at Lexus Nexus. And uh, so I had a moment to, to speak to some of you about uh, what you uh, expect to get out of today's talk. And hopefully we can cover those items. And uh, also, uh, for those of you who have Twitter accounts, uh, you may have seen some tweets out there about uh, um, some questions uh, out in the, in the Twitter sphere. We'll, uh, we'll ask those questions afterwards, and those individuals who have answers uh, can uh, uh, win a prize. And uh, then also, uh, Christina is passing out some, uh, uh, some questions as well for a couple of giveaways up here. A book on the, a handbook on data intensive computing and also uh, free template. So uh, stay tuned for those. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I have the first half of the presentation where we speak a little bit about what uh, HPCC Systems is, and then I'll hand it over to Bill, and he can speak to you more about uh, some of the applications uh, that have uh, been implemented on the system, on the platform, uh, specifically around fraud and so who is, who or what is HPCC Systems? So the uh, company, LexisNexis Risk Solutions, uh, we have about 15 years of experience in the big data sphere. Uh, and uh, LexisNexis Risk Solutions is a company that specializes in data services about people. So each and every one of you have probably used LexisNexis Risk Solutions services and you didn't even know it. Uh, we're mostly a B2B company. But for the past 15 years, or I'm sorry, for the past 10 years, we've had a technology that has run this multi-billion dollar business. And we call it the HPCC uh, platform. And it is a data intensive, high performance computing cluster that runs the business. Uh, and uh, we can get into what, what exactly runs the business means in just a few moments. But more importantly, uh, last June, we open sourced it. And uh, now that same technology is available to each and every one of you in the room. And in fact, in just a moment, I'll, uh, I'll spin up a cluster for you to show you how easy it is uh, that each and every one of you can do that and your IT folks uh, can have access to it very easily. Uh, and then I'll, uh, as that's spinning up, we'll, we'll come back to it in just a moment and we'll continue on with the presentation. So if those of you with laptops, you can go to this website and I'll show it to you right here. Here's our, here's our main website. Uh, for the uh, for the open source platform, and then if you just prepend aws.hpccsystems, you'll get this website here. Um, before you log in, you'll see this, and there's really only one thing you need uh, to log in and to to run a cluster of your own, and that is uh, an Amazon login. Uh, our, our platform runs on, uh, you know, in a non-Amazon space, but this is just to make it easy for our community, and there are plenty of you out there who already have Amazon accounts. So, uh, once you log in, you see this site here. You click on Launch Cluster. You can, if you're familiar with Amazon, you can choose a particular region. And uh, we allow you to, in, through this interface, to have a cluster of one to 200 uh, uh, nodes. You can have more, but you just talk to us first. And we can launch a three node system. If you already have data in a snapshot, you can connect to it. And you just click Launch Cluster. And it goes out to Amazon and does uh, all the busy work for you, uh, uh, setting, uh, putting together the uh, security uh, uh, parameters, uh, the, uh, uh, the keys that you need, bringing up the nodes, configuring everything, and in just a few moments you'll have a cluster of your own. But let's, we'll come back to that later. So here we are uh, back at our presentation here, and we just finished up with uh, you know, who is uh, LexisNexis and who is HPCC Systems, and we're, we're that group within uh, LexisNexis Risk Solutions that uh, for the past 10 years has been providing those, uh, uh, that platform and platform support. Uh, one other important point uh, is that we've been, uh, we've been selling those clusters for a, a significant period of time, uh, but it's usually been to uh, uh, you know, other businesses that have had needs over the past 10 years like ours. So internally, we, we have this concept called the complete big data value chain, which you see up there. And it uh, it includes collection of the data, 
ingestion, discovery and cleansing, integration, analysis and delivery of that data. And those are all very important functions within the organization. And previously, uh, you needed a very complex technology stack to implement that complete big data value chain. But with our system, uh, you only need one technology. And uh, we see that uh, in, the, in our own business and also the businesses that we support uh, with the technology. And uh, inside the HPCC uh, platform, we have something called the Thor Cluster, which is like a gigantic hammer, and that's how we came up with the name. And that is what we quote unquote pound the data with. Right? We, we uh, mine all of the gold uh, out of all of that dirt that is big data. And the Roxy, which is the data delivery engine. And they work very closely together. And the ECL, uh, the data scientist or the, de the developer, only needs to know one technology, and that is ECL. Uh, and it is a, a declarative language that they can code in that they can own that whole big data value chain. And you see that up here on slide five again. And to us, that is a very important aspect of our platform from a business perspective, that a single individual can own that whole process. You don't need legions of engineers all with uh, uh, owning different uh, platforms to get a process done. Also, what it means is when something changes within the organization, we can go back to the very beginning, back to the ingestion phase, and we're still sitting at that same IDE, and we just click a button, and uh, those changes propagate throughout that whole process. So here's a little bit more detail in terms of what Thor does, which is, uh, which, like I said, is that big hammer in the Roxy, and then ECL at the bottom. And you can see a quote down there, which I will read. I, I try not to read from slides, but ECL is to big data as SQL is uh, to relational data. So a little bit in terms of street creds, there's many different ways that you can look at a platform, and, and I agree that this is only one way. And we responded to a challenge that was out there in terms of TerraSort. And uh, they took a certain amount of data. You can take a look at our website and get all of the details. Um, uh, one of the companies out there took a certain amount of data. They were the previous leader. And uh, you can see on the right side of that uh, slide, on slide seven, the number of nodes that they used, I believe they used a full rack. And you can see the number of nodes that we used uh, down there represented as well. And way to the left, you can see even though we used a significant fraction, minor, minor fraction of, uh, of the number of nodes, that we still uh, came in far faster. Uh, and uh, if you were to, s were fully horizontally scalable, uh, and if you were to scale that out uh, in with the testing that we've done as well, uh, we come in far, far below. But the other thing that you see there in terms of productivity is we took their code, uh, their Java MapReduce code, and uh, compared it to ours. We only had three lines of code. They had 700 lines of Java MapReduce. And that's a good segue into one of the key differences between us and uh, many of the other platforms out there is that we're not predicated on MapReduce. So we can easily support it, but we're not limited by it. And uh, that, uh, that alone creates a lot of efficiencies within our technology. So some of the benefits of our platform, uh, speed, not only in terms of business speed or speed to get products out the door, but also speed of execution <coughs> as well, which leads to a smaller footprint. Uh, the capacity, the ability to do massive joins, and we're not talking about just the standard joins that you see in SQL, but also some of the ones that SQL believes are theoretical which generally aren't implemented. And those include fuzzy joins as well, merges, sorts, transforms, and of course, uh, cost savings in terms of not only hardware, but also people. Uh, so there are two, uh, two websites that you can see, uh, hpccsystems.com and also aws.hpccsystems.com. So I'm just gonna take a, a brief moment now, and we'll go back to Uh, the clusters that we launched. And you can see here, if you look in the log, uh, 
We launched it at 10.50 and 11 seconds. And at 10.52 and 13 seconds, we have that cluster up and running. So I'm going to go ahead and go to view clusters here. And I can actually go to the cluster and just run a little bit of code. There's a lot of people on Wi-Fi right now, so I just have to bear with me. <coughs> we can say output, hello, world. Hold on just a second. Ah, there we go. I misspelled output. And there we go. We also have a fully integrated IDE. Uh, you don't have to use this uh, clunky web interface, but and it provides all kinds of cool information about your data uh, and how, uh, how exactly the ECL is processing. So with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Bill. So for that, for us, this has been really uh, transformative. I did my first uh, very large organized crime case in 1992 for one of the top insurance companies, literally with red thread and index cards on a wall for people that were related by blood and white thread and index cards for people that were related by a business relationship and, and set up a federal RICO case that way. So being able to leverage this kind of data to do what we do is, is really taking what we do into the next level. And I had an interesting conversation out at one of the booths this morning talking about this and he said, so this is what, like a $10 billion problem, healthcare and proper payments. It's probably closer to a $400 billion problem of the three trillion that we're now up to spending on healthcare. So this is a, a really the first time you're able to do this kind of stuff. Um, when we talk about big data in our world, we're talking about data that's too much data for the customer to handle. They don't know what to do with it. They have a lot of it. Uh, we have a lot of it. They have no conception of how to leverage it to do what they want to do. And we really talk about with them across the whole business, but we're going to concentrate today on what we did in one particular area. And there's an interesting McKinsey white paper that suggests in healthcare, big data should be a $300 billion transformative business. So what we did here was we used relationship analytics, which to us basically means the ability to link people, assets, providers of healthcare, family relations, shared addresses, basically who are you in the world as opposed to who are you just in the data that a health plan has. And that allows us to show collusion that they can't see even when they use some kind of sophisticated linking system, and you'll see a very graphic example of this, on their own data, they get nowhere near the picture, and this is money that we're talking about, that, that we see when we do it. And really what we're doing is in essence, and you are all from very familiar with this, and we do a lot more explaining when we talk to health entities about this, but basically what we're doing is we're taking their data, placing it on this graph of data that we have, and in our database, in essence, we've disambiguated 35 billion public documents down to 250 million disambiguated identities, or everybody who's adult who's hit the grid in the United States, and there's four billion derived links in that database. So we virtually instantly see relationships that otherwise can't be revealed. And the speed and the power of the HPC system allows us to do it in very rapid time frames. So the addition of the external data is really sort of the analytic juice that we bring to everything that we do. So as opposed to other entities that will say, oh, we can link the data together, we can do predictive analytics, you know, we bring our 50 terabyte database of public data to the party, as well as the ability to accelerate the process of how this is done. One of the issues in really bending the cost curve is being able to do this kind of detection, particularly predictive analytics, before claims are paid. 
And in healthcare, there's a huge issue around you have to pay these claims very often in 14 days. So the ability to do predictive analytics, deliver them in virtual real time so that someone can look at the claims and not pay them is really where the whole industry is trying to go. And what we are able to do by doing the relationship analytics is then say, okay, we understand that we have a problem with this provider or that provider. Now we can link them together and see the full scope of what the issue we're having is at one time as opposed to finding out six months later that we had a whole bunch of stuff that we just weren't able to see because we didn't have the analytics to do it. What really, when, when I was at one of the initial conversations when we were talking to the CEO of the company about taking this stuff open source, um, that has really given analytics that power to get into healthcare. Uh, we get asked sometimes, was well, there really that much data? So if you look at you know, the larger insurers, commercial insurers in the country, you're talking about 20, 30, 50 million covered lives. There's claims data, there's business data, there's clinical data, medical devices are now collecting data. So there's a tremendous amount of data and what they're trying to do now is integrate that with other sorts of data. You hear a lot of talk about consumer-driven healthcare, treating the patient, but really they don't know that much about the consumer, about the patient. They have a clinical or a claims record of the treatment they've had, but this data that's out there about them in the world, they don't know how to leverage. And that's very important in both improving care as well as the fraud examples that we're going to talk about today. So how do we do this uh, on the HPC system? We have a Lex ID, so everyone in the country has a 12-digit identification that that's how we create, say, an identity envelope for each person. Um, then we can take those and create clusters around the relationships that exist between those people. And a lot of the data, it's not just 35 billion records sitting in a pot, but it's constantly scored. There's algorithms that decide which data goes with which. Are, are these relationships significant? So we're actually creating a lot of proprietary data, a lot of structured data within there. We add our own aggregate data to that puzzle. And then we can start to systematically identify important clusters. So as we understand through doing predictive analytics and other kind of analytics, what relationships between people, providers, assets are significant, we can then start to score those so that the machine itself can actually be drawing together clusters that would seem to be significant to solve this particular business problem. We trim those links down. Obviously, there's a ball of yarn problem here. If you go out about three degrees of relationship, you get into the six degrees of Kevin Bacon and everybody's related to everyone. So it's very important to not only be able to draw the relationships, but also to be able to trim them into something that's significant and brings actionable intelligence to, to the customers. And then we can output in the visualization files. One of the things we do a lot of talking about with less sophisticated audiences is that everybody can draw a picture. There's plenty of visualization programs. It's, it's what the picture is drawn from and what the picture means that makes the distance. So actually it's the statistical output of what we're doing that's more interesting than the picture itself. So the unique ID is, is this Lex ID and in essence what we're taking is millions of public records that are coming in each day using the system itself to be able to draw down that data so that we have you know close to a 99.9% .9 ability to relate. So I have a very common name. Even when I was practicing law in Philadelphia, I used to get mail for five or six other Bill Foxes who were attorneys in Philadelphia. So it's probably 10,000 of me. So how do you know that that record that just came in goes to me? And that's really what the database does. <laughs> Updates vary, it's completely rebuilt every month and that's been going on for about 10 years and it's an iterative rebuild so it gets better each time it gets rebuilt. Uh, it's extremely accurate. Uh, we get asked these questions a lot and it connects to information maintained throughout data sources within our company. So how do we create these clusters? So this is what it starts to look at. When you start to look at an actual application, an actual case, we want to know how the claimant, the person that's billing the insurance company is related to the medical provider. How are they related to that incident, whether that incident might be a car accident, it might be coming down with some kind of illness. 
how are they related to possibly the witnesses that are being deposed or being interviewed for a case, how are they related to the attorney, uh, and this was the exact sort of template that we used when I was prosecuting these cases, I'm a former federal prosecutor. Um, when we were prosecuting these cases, this, we see this over and over again. The problem is, and we'll talk about a, a, a job we did for New York Medicaid, is that the scope of resources required to investigate these is often simply beyond the scope of resources that an agency has or that an insurance company has. So we used to talk about it in terms of FTEs, you know, how many FTEs does it save to be able to do this, but really what you're talking about is investigations that can't be done versus now they can be done because there's no resources to do them the old-fashioned way. So now we get into the really clear picture. So this is real data from a very, very large insurance company. Each snowflake there represents an actual proven fraudulent claim that came in and the people that were attached to it. So these had already been to the special investigative unit, shown to be fraudulent, money recovered, and then they took an internal linking system that they had and they decided, well, let's see if we can figure out how these are related to each other. And they came to us, we do some things for them, and they said, you know, how cool is this? We figured out that these two claims were linked by a family member, so there's this family that's putting together these fraud rings. So we say, that's fantastic. Give that to us and let us look at it in our system. And we go out what we call two degrees of relatives and associates, and this is the picture that we bring back to them. So not only were there dozens of connections between the original seven claims in terms of shared addresses and assets and family relationships and business ownership and other things like that, but much more importantly, we identified 11 other claims that are in their system. They already paid, went right through, nobody saw that they were linked to these fraudulent claims. Whatever rules-based systems they're using to detect fraud didn't pick this up. They avoided them. So what they're seeing is an incomplete picture of what's going on, of the business problem that they have. So say you take a random number, $200,000 for each one of these. So in essence, they're seeing the tip of this iceberg. So they're seeing $1.4 million if you use that random number. We're seeing $3.6 million. So this isn't just like cool and we can do this cool stuff that you previously couldn't do. This is real money because if they're able to detect that at the front end, and it's very well known in our industry, the farther out you get from when the incident happened, the less money you recover. And that's why we're trying to move from postpay to prepay. But even in postpay, even if it's already been paid, the ability to see it all at once and go after it brings tremendous business value. And obviously the speed of the HPC system that this work is done on is integral to be able to take this massive, massive amount of data, see through it, and, and make this clear. So what do we do for New York? So the uh, ex-Medicaid Inspector General of New York, who is now the Chief Integrity Officer for the City of New York, and I were colleagues at the Philadelphia Office of the U.S. Attorney when we were prosecutors. So he called me up and he said, you know, he's very skeptical of vendors, very skeptical of technology, but I get this little pass because I was a federal prosecutor. And he says, okay, here's the problem. I have 509 people, Russians, living in a condominium complex on Brighton Beach. The average price of a condo is around 1.1 million and they're all on Medicaid. So it would be minorly interesting if there were 509 people in New York on Medicaid that had million dollar condos, but it's really interesting if they all live in the same building. Obviously there's collusion there, and this is the perfect example of a case that just cannot be investigated. Do you, do you open 509 investigations with your investigators who already have a backlog of 4,000 files sitting behind them that they can't get to, and hope that you hit on somebody that actually knows what's going on, it isn't just some flunky that was paid $500 to get a Medicaid card? It, it just doesn't work. This is a forever investigation. So all we got were the names, addresses, phone numbers, SSN, that's it. No claims data, nothing about providers. We, want, we wanted the whole Medicaid list, we want all the providers. They didn't do that. One of the interesting things in our industry is explaining that the more data that you give us, the better the output is and the less work you'll have to do on the back end. But all we got was the name, addresses, and phone numbers. So how do we do it? 
we take what they give us, we decide what some of the important parameters are. So since this is a Medicaid case, it's important to know what assets people own, what businesses they are connected to, do they have ownership interests, do, do they work at one of the providers that are involved in the cluster, how many of them are receiving benefits, how many people in the cluster aren't receiving benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the fun slide. These are the automobiles owned by the people in Medicaid uh, on these clusters. And these are not 20-year-old uh, cars. These are 27-year-old attorney who owns a 90, you know, a 2011 BMW 650. And one of the things we see here is even though there is some screening done for this, because they can't connect together the people the way we can, this gets through. So one of the things that have been implemented is much more uh, thorough screening in the city for these kinds of things. But when you see this, it sort of just makes it very clear uh, the, what we can see through. Now this is where it gets really interesting. So you wouldn't think that mortgage flipping, flipping and flopping, flipping is when you make a profit, flopping is when you take a loss in order to start to take equity out of a property. It's a launder, money laundering technique. So you wouldn't think that that would be related necessarily to healthcare fraud, but it is. So the reason why they've got these 500 people in this one complex, and all these names have been changed obviously, is because they can then have them also flip properties back and forth to each other and launder money from other criminal activities. Generally what you see, and we, we talked about this at a conference a few weeks ago, is criminals act like criminals. So they're just not doing healthcare fraud, they're doing all kinds of other stuff. Healthcare fraud is fun because you don't have to stand on the corner and sling crack and get shot at, you can sit in a basement and have access to three trillion dollars. But they're doing other stuff and they've got all this cash and they have to find a way to make it disappear and this is a great way. So one of the things that we find now is we call this in essence a remora for healthcare fraud. If we see this kind of activity going on, we now know that there might be other kinds of activity. We've actually tracked the entire country and we can give you sort of a block by block what is the velocity of deed transfer and it's been very interesting as you would imagine to the mortgage companies and this was about the 65th most active block for flipping of deeds in the country. So the pilot could have been better if we had more data, of course, but in other words, if they give us the claims, then we can identify the values of the clusters for them and tell them, you know, here's where you should start because this one was 10 million and this one was 3 million. If you tell us who's on the Medicaid roll, then we can identify for you that in the readout and the visualization. These are the kind of statistical output that you're getting. So when you look at a certain person, you can immediately say, how many people is he connected to? Is he on Medicaid? How many providers are in this cluster and who are they? What are the assets associated, the cars you see in the lower left-hand corner? So it's very important to be able to do that. And then of course, what everybody expects to see is the picture. Uh, we try to make the picture much more valuable and if you're seeing this for real hooked into the HPCC system, into our database, you can click on any one of those icons and see when did they buy the car, how much it was worth, who did they buy it from, where do they live. So there's an at, there's an icon for owning a property over $300,000, $300, there's an icon for owning a property that you don't live in for over $300,000. So this picture can be very valuable. You can slide around and see what cluster is connected to what other cluster. So really all this is made possible and uh, is absolutely blowing people's hair back when we show it to them. Um, healthcare is like kind of moving the Titanic and we're trying to get them to really understand the value of this. But uh, it's been very transformative for me since I came to Lexus two years ago to be able to go back in and show the people that I know from my prior life what we can actually do now as opposed to having one guy sitting at a computer punching out stuff literally on Google and Excel. So uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Charles. Sure. So we, um, we sped through quite a bit very, very rapidly, right? And I uh, just in mingling with the... Uh, uh, with the crowd before the presentation, I know there are uh, IT folks out there, I know there are business folks out there, and uh, we were hoping that instead of boring half of the group with uh, one aspect or the other half with another, uh, we could turn it over to the, uh, to the crowd uh, and you can ask some questions, some uh, burning need questions or some, some self-interest questions. Uh, and if you don't have questions of your own, we came up with a few to, to get the uh, conversation started, both on the HPCC platform side and also on the healthcare. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm curious, 
kind of um, analytic libraries have been built or are trying to be built on top of ETL? That's a great question. Can you repeat the question, please? Can you repeat the question? Sure. He wants to know what, uh, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Jesse Shane Carl. Jesse wants to know what uh, types of, uh, of uh, <coughs> packages have been built for the HPCC platform. And uh, it's open source, and so we're building a community around it, and there are a number of folks who are building their own proprietary packages. Uh, but we also built a machine learning package as well. And you can find the white paper for that, and also uh, the code, which is out on GitHub, uh, for that machine learning package. The interesting aspect of our machine learning package is it's completely scaled. And you don't find that with many of the other packages out there. Uh, what you find is, yes, we, we integrate into Hadoop. And you find that they do a map, and then a reduce, and then they pipe into and out of the package. And then uh, I was at a Hadoop uh, presentation, and someone else raised their hand and said, great, but how did you scale that? And they said, yeah, we're still working on that. <laughs> so uh, one of the great aspects of our platform is everything you do from step one, because it is in a fully scaled language, uh, the ECL engineer doesn't need to know whether he's on a single node or a hundred node or a thousand node system. And when he builds a machine learning package, it is scaled. Uh, there's no other way to write it. And, uh, and so uh, thank you very much for your question. I saw another one over here. Yes? Yeah, about a year ago, on 60 Minutes, there was a I'm sorry, would you mind uh, saying I, your name? I'm David Russo. David, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, about a year ago, there was an article on 60 Minutes, you probably know the one, where the Medicare frauds, you know, people that didn't seem that clever were able to defraud a Medicare out of tens of millions of dollars. What you have here what seems to be a, a golden tool to get in between that and recovery. What's the slowdown? What, what, what are those we, impediments that you talk about? We agree. <laughs> what, what are the impediments? The impediments are, well, there's a number of impediments in healthcare. One of the problems is protected health information. So the, the industry is not set up for data sharing. So there's 70 million insureds at United, and there's 20 million at Humana, and there's 30 million at WellPoint, and there's others in Medicare and Medicaid, and that data is not easily shared. Now, if CMS has just launched a huge predictive modeling initiative, um, it's meeting with limited success by, by at least the Senate's uh, appraisal. So we are moving into this very rapidly. We're in constant conversation with them. We're doing this work for a number of states. Uh, even simple stuff that our system can do, you give us the list of all the providers in your network. Well, we have 35 billion documents about those providers. We bump it up against that, link them in, and return a scored listing of the derogatory indicators connected to your providers. Some of them are dead. Some of them don't have licenses, some of them have been sanctioned, some of them had three bankruptcies last year, which could be a driver for crime. So there's some very simple stuff we're doing, and then introducing the more complex analytics. But as you can see, I mean, the example we showed was for New York Medicaid. And if you might have seen an article, if, I don't, who's around here, but there was an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago that they made this gigantic Russian fraud bust in, in New York. So it's starting. Um, a lot of the technology is very new and the understanding of it is new. So you take, so I'm going back to a lot of my former colleagues who are ex-prosecutors, ex-law enforcement, and sort of getting them to understand the power of this. And there, there is some resistance to, well, I want to investigate the case. And there's some resistance to that purely data-driven sort of analytics. Uh, but it's, it's happening. So I, I think just to add to that, one of the key differentiators that we have is uh, even though we may be new in terms of our availability to you, uh, we are not new in terms of uh, how long we've been doing this and uh, you know, how long we've been running multi-billion dollar businesses uh, you know, from one end to the other uh, on our technology. Yeah, I mean, we have a tool called Accurant, and one of the reasons I came to Lexis was because when I was a federal prosecutor, I used Accurant to basically do every investigation that I did, and that's if I know I want to investigate Jesse, I can find him on Accurant and find out all this data, and I used that, I knew what was in there and, and, and what it could do if we were able to develop healthcare solutions from it. Other questions? Yes. Could you, would you mind stating your name?
to collect this information about each and every of us. And is there any challenge in actually acquiring this information in different prices? I know, for example, uh, in different uh, places, such as in Europe, <coughs> uh, the rules of privacy and what you can collect and what you can share and what you can use and retail are very different. So I assume there are challenges in actually getting that information in the first place in the system. And the second question goes more into it really looks like a solution that can potentially uh, detect growth in almost any type of context, not only the healthcare. So is there any other example you can share of you know, maybe the retail, maybe in banking, maybe in other context in which you start thinking of line or there is interest? Do you mind if I answer that first? So there's a couple of, of broad questions that you're asking, and then you're asking some specific questions to healthcare. And uh, so let me tackle a couple of those, and then you can tell me whether or not I've answered all of them, because I think there are, there are a couple of them squished in there. So the first is uh, in terms of uh, industry, right? Uh, and uh, the technology and the tools that we've provided are general use in the big data or data intensive computing space. And so we provided a specific example of fraud in healthcare. But that's not the only example that we work on or that, uh, that other folks in academia or our community works on. And that includes uh, folks, uh, uh, PhDs and computer scientists who are doing their own research on our platform because they find it's powerful enough uh, to do that low-level research. But it also includes data scientists uh, who are not only working on fraud, but who, are, uh, who may have originally not had a big data problem having absolutely nothing to do with fraud, but in today's world they're generating so much data, they need a big data solution like ours behind it uh, so that they can get the answers that they need. And once again, having absolutely nothing to do with fraud. Uh, the other question that you asked, uh, that you asked a business question about data and getting data in, and I'm going to hand that one off to Bill in just a moment. Uh, but from a technology perspective, we ingest thousands and thousands of data sources at every moment. We're doing that right now as we speak. And the, the tools and the technology that we use to do that is just this platform, and it does it very well. And those types of data sources for the technology folks out there, I'll throw a couple of words out, Big Endian, Little Endian, uh, Fixed Width, HTML, XML, Free Text, Structured, Unstructured, Semi-Structured, uh, we ingest all of those with ease. So, uh, Bill. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you the Extreme Reader's Digest version. We maintain two databases. There's an FCRA, Fair Credit Reporting Act database, that has one set of security around it. So if an employer is actually going to use our, we're, I think we're the second biggest screening company in the w country, if an employer is going to use this data to actually say you cannot hire this person because they have this fact in their past, that's one kind of database. The big database is, is not FCRA, so you can't make those, so there's a permissible use for each database. So that's one of the ways that the, that the information is controlled. We audit our own customers to make sure that they're only using the information that we give them for the purpose that they're allowed to use it. Obviously, every piece of data has its own rules. So if we're collecting things from licensure agencies in every state, some states put it out, some states don't. You can only get what you can get. But there's over 10,000 sources that this is coming through. So in essence, there's a complete privacy, security, and legal structure around this data to make sure that the data that's in each database is what's supposed to be there. You can track back through it if that's the permissible use that you're using it for, and our customers are only using it for what they're allowed to. In terms of your other question, we're, we're having a huge amount of success looking at mortgage fraud. If a company knows these are bad mortgages that I've had over the last six months. Tell me what other ones in my system also might be bad because they're related to these out in the world. So in the same way that a provider who's barred from Medicaid in Florida might move up to New York and have his sister-in-law open the same kind of clinic and we can see that it's the sister-in-law, the same way in a, in a mortgage scheme they might be flipping houses and we can see that relationship in the data. So it can, it's used in mortgage, it's used in financial, it's used in banking across virtually every industry. There's a risk solution in 97% of the Fortune 500. So it's very much used across every, every industry. And let me provide you a, a quick perspective on what he's saying, but give you some real world examples. Right, so if, you, if we went back to this big data uh, value chain, that is very powerful from a perspective of we have one platform that handles that whole chain, right? So let me give you some concrete examples. Imagine a world where you needed a completely separate system to pre-process that data and get it into your big data system. We, we don't need that, right? But imagine a world where you did. 
Or imagine a world where you had multiple systems that handled your big data needs. We see this so often. A company says, well, I needed to build this system to handle this need, and it didn't work with this other problem, so we had to build a completely separate system, right? We've seen uh, businesses that have had 300 Oracle databases, right? Now imagine a world that you have a business problem that you have to control and manage all of that data, right? You have a sheer technical problem now because you have all of these processes bolted on to your big data solution. And how are you going to manage that? How many people do you need to manage? Who has access to what? To all of those databases and the data that gets pre-processed? We have one system that handles that. And it's in that elegance and simplicity that makes things much easier for us. I'm getting a time.